In 2012, I know I knew nothing. Uh, I didn't know that people in forestry use last tools. And I was very surprised when I got this invitation to be a keynote speaker in 2012, uh, where I met Lewis, and he apparently liked my talk, so he wanted me to give a follow-up what has happened since 2012. The talk in 2012, if you weren't there, it was called you know, The Story of LA Stools. Um, and it was basically telling you why, if you today go on Google Image Search, and you type in laser chickens, the auto-completion has something to do with a nuclear weapons lab. I don't know if that only happens on my computer, uh, because the CIA is tracking my MAC address. Uh, if you could try that and tell me if it also works on your computer. Uh, I was looking for funny imagers, and I have this funny thing was actually the autocomplete. And also, my other passion was I was an urban farmer. I was really into green things. I had chickens, I had bees, I made an urban farm. I, I, I had vegetable beds and recycling and everything like this, and I wanted to combine it all into one operation somehow with LIDAR. And when I found this house for sale, the last farmhouse in Livermore, California, I bought it with the idea that in the back of this house, I was going to create the hippest farm ever by bringing in the lasers because I wanted to film my activities with remote sensing technology because just at the time Radiohead came out with House of Cards, a video that was filmed with, a, with that uh, first Velodyne scanner. And I was super excited about it and I thought the lab would go along with it, but they were very hesitant and they didn't like that. It was too hippie, too weird, the idea. Uh, so I went to a conference where all the you know, more courageous minds were mingling and I gave a very funny talk that was very well received by these people but not at all received well by my employer. And that was where the laser chickens come from, by the way. Uh, so when you get in trouble with a nuclear weapons lab that is known for the biggest laser you know, built on Earth, then there is likely to be fallout. And the fallout was that I ended up four months in, uh, in, in, deta in detention, uh, in deportation hold, and eventually got shipped back to Germany. So when I got this message from Mike Wolder as an invitation to a keynote, I like, wow. Because I was not at a good place in my life at that point. I tried last tools as my plan B. And that was just about when times were sort of swinging back. And I was so happy I brought Last Canopy because the one forester I knew was Andy Hudak. I asked him, what present can I bring them? And he told me, oh, make, make fusion metrics at last full speed. They're going to like that. So that's how Last Canopy was born. And yes, things really turned around. I turned around my logo, and then I made the first press release. And uh, yeah, and it looked like I was going to be you know, just like another LiDAR company. Uh, I won an award for the compression engine. And I did my first, uh, you know, a bit improvised appearances at, at, at shows, a bit you know, more, more orderly. And then I got featured in some magazine, and I thought, oh, maybe I have a company, I hire some people, you know, become a CEO and so on. But whom was I kidding? Uh, this was more the life I had in mind. And uh, eventually I got there. How did I get there? Well, shortly after Sylvie Laser, I read on Twitter that the Philippines was going to have a really cool project scanning the entire country for flood mapping purposes because they get hit by typhoons all the time. So uh, I read about the project and the project seemed amazing. It was implemented at a university in a country that has no technological uh, capabilities at the time. Professors were guiding it, students were doing the work, only teachers were going to be hired and I really wanted to be one of those teachers. So I went on email, I, I, I contacted the guy, he said, well, come meet me in Thailand at this conference. So I flew to Thailand, I met him, and I said, I can come and help you train your students, and I'm very flexible. And he said, okay, when can you come? Two weeks from now? I said, yes. So two weeks later, just after Christmas, I flew to Philippines for the first time in my life. And because it was the Philippines, I added a week of vacation. So I went to this beach not far from Manila, and said, wow, this is, this is a life. This is really the life. Uh, and this could be a beautiful office, I thought to myself. And whenever you're stuck with some algorithm, you just walk down the beach and you get some inspiration. And eventually I had to leave that beach and actually do the work. And this was, this was a really changing moment in Last Tool's uh, life because I got to hang out with, this is a program leader, in the Philippines a lot with all these young scientists that were really eager and keen to learn and they didn't really have a big educational backbone you know, with, with LIDAR and, and geo, geo uh, photogrammetry techniques and so, as, as we have it uh, in, in most of our countries. 
So I spent a week training, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and the people seemed to like my software. Uh, but it could have been that there was uh, pizza parties and t-shirt contests, and I got a suggestion for a better t-shirt. Uh, and uh, on the last day, I like, oh, I have to go now. So it was so much fun. And then I asked the, the program leader, can I just come back? How about I come back for two, three months, and you give me a cubicle here, and I give you free consulting, and I'll learn what I need to put in last tools to handle national scale LiDAR surveys, and you know, it's gonna win-win situation. And also, uh, you know, I get to have fun in the Philippines, and here, one of those was in my cubicle for two, three months, and I got to have fun in the Philippines, occasionally take trips to beautiful islands, and maybe uh, I did some of the customer replies right while drinking pina coladas. And uh, I, I became the biggest fan of this project. I nominated them for, the, for a big award, and awards are good when you have a project because then the politicians are convinced they have done the right thing. And I got to hang out with, well, I got a free meal and I got to hang out with some politicians. And this uh, Minister of Science and Technology, I not only got a selfie with him, but I also had a long discussion about open data with him and about the importance. And he was a science background guy. And he said, oh, you should come and talk to our you know, policy leaders at the big event that's coming up. And by the way, you're gonna like to have some news for you. I said, what? We're going to expand the project. It was so successful, we're going to go from one university to 15 universities, and they're going to all process the data around where they are. And further than that, we're not only going to do it for flood mapping, we will repurpose the data for researchy projects to do all kinds of land cover classification, uh, energy mapping, uh, coastal resource mapping, all these kind of things. And we need somebody that trains people with LIDAR at all these universities and do you want to be that person? And I said, awesome. And a few months later, I went back and we had a one week training at a room full of people that never opened the last file in their life. And at the end of the week, they basically could do a DTM production and you know, a quality checking. It was three people from all of these 15 universities coming together. I was filmed. They went through you know, the hard steps of listening to all of my jokes. They took the film material back with them and made their students, their entire team, look through these uh, you know, jokes uh, and the, the several hours of video processing also. But I told them, I'll come, I'll come back to you. I'll visit each one of your universities and we do a workshop locally. Uh, and I also get to go to this thing and talk about uh, Open LiDAR. And ultimately they did create a LiDAR portal it's not open LIDAR yet, but I think in Asia that's the only country that has a LIDAR portal where you can go online, you can request data, and they may say no if you don't have a good reason. I never tried to request data, but um, this being a spokesperson for open LIDAR once then sort of led to other engagement. There was at the Asian Conference for Remote Sensing where I gave a very passionate speech about open LIDAR because in all my travels, I noticed that the access to LIDAR is very limited in, in Southeast Asia. England, for 17 years, was having a major operation going, collecting LIDAR for flood mapping purposes, but they wouldn't give it to anybody. Until the day that this one lady made this Freedom of Information request asking, how much money you actually make in selling it? Because that's the main reason they always say they can't give it to you. We need the sales income to finance the, re in the next survey. But that's utterly not true. So whenever somebody says that, it's never true because they got 300,000 pounds per year. Now, to me, that sounds a lot of money, but if you look that they spend a billion dollars a year as operating budget, that barely pays for the coffee and the tea in the offices. So nine months later, that data went open. And the wonderful thing is, this agency went from the hogger of LIDA, like the, the antagonist of open, to the protagonist. They were like the champions of open. They went all over the place. They, everybody celebrated them and they, they are now associated with open data in Europe. And that's a, an opportunity. If you're in an area where there's no open data yet, if you change, you know, everybody forgets instantly what you have done in the past and you become the hero, uh, like the Environment Agency in, uh, in England. In my own country, fortunately, the situation was also bad. So I, it's not like I go around and lecture people because it's really bad in my country and I tried very hard to replicate this. I also put in freedom of information requests. I asked them, the situation was exactly the same. Limited amount of data is, uh, amount of money is made, the data is withheld until 
uh, two years ago, then the first open LIDAR also comes to Germany, and I think now the, the threshold is reached, it's going to be all open in a matter of time. I also learned finally about some uh, uh, forestry things. I learned how you guys uh, measure the height of trees in the field, uh, in, uh, or destructively or non-destructively. Uh, I took part in measuring the biomass of forests, how you slice them up, how you dry them, how you measure the carbon. Uh, and, but I was really invited to do the LIDAR part, um, to do a teach LIDAR to foresters. And everything went well, but that one LIDAR tile I picked had some really funny artifacts that looked like this. And I was like, ah, oh, damn it, I should have tested it first, not just you know, done it out of the cold. But then I noticed it's a regular pattern. Maybe it's not a bug in my software. Maybe there is a bug on the ground, or there's a feature on the ground. And it's not uh, fish ponds, um, but it was uh, um, tank positions of the Russians when they uh, moved towards uh, Hitler, Germany. They were dug around 1944, and the plantation forests had grown there since. So we went to check them out, and that was quite impressive. Like, I had not expected that, to sort of a conflict archaeology little finds in these Polish forests. And then I met this gentleman who was in the same hotel, and he was there to look for bunkers. He collected bunker GPS locations like other people collect stamps as his hobby. And it was because when he was little, his dad always told him, don't play at the bunkers, bunkers are bad. And well, that, now it's his hobby. So he told me he's looking for these bunkers this weekend. And I told him, oh, well, maybe we have LIDAR there. So we, you know, documents. And then we went there. He asked me, you want to come this weekend? And I had another uh, school to teach the following week. So I had a free weekend. I said, yeah, but let's have a look. So uh, that's how these uh, bunkers look today. Uh, and it was super interesting. They look kind of like hobbit homes because they're all moss covered now. And, but if you, if you go back, you know, in the times when those bunkers were under, under fire, I mean, uh, it's, it's really surreal to, because it's super peaceful today there. And uh, to think back of how horrible it must have been in those days. Um, I really noticed how much I like teaching. So I went teaching all over Asia, mainly because I couldn't teach in North America due to some complications with the nuclear weapons lab. Uh, that really made other nations benefit. So I, I sought out, really actively sought out opportunities to go and teach. And the most fun was the Asian Conference Remote Sensing Summer Schools, because you got this diverse crowd of students, not only Asians, pretty much international students. And uh, I also noticed that you really have to put in lots of jokes into your day-long lectures, otherwise the students just doze off. And I also noticed we produce too much plastic during these events. I mean, look at this. It's one, three, three, four, five bottles of plastic. And then we had a conference where every student gets a, a yummy meal, you know, but it's all covered in plastic. And we call the conference sustainable. I mean, that makes no sense. So uh, I started bringing that to the attention of the conference managers. And the next uh, summer school was organized super green. And eventually, the Chinese Association for Photogrammetry and Remote Sending gave me the Green Asia Award for my you know, little activities. And I thought, wow, now I have a, now I have a mandate to, to do that everywhere. So at a Phosphor G conference in Tanzania, I noticed the same thing. So I made a tweet about it. And then somebody else noticed it and completely changed their conference in Sri Lanka to be all green. And when I was visiting club and I had, I, I noticed these cups and I knew, you know, Louis was going to organize a conference. I said, hey, maybe use these cups, you know, better than plastic. And uh, well, look at the cups we have now. Here they are. Uh, that worked out. So, I mean, it's little things. I mean, Louis went way farther with these uh, carbon credits uh, and I, I want to know more about it. Um, but the social component is also very big at the Asian conference on remote sensing. Sometimes you have to be a bit goofy, but apparently that's in any ways my style. But you know, one day you're dancing with Balinese dancers, and the next moment you have Star Wars. You know, all-out war. What happened? Well, LADS is an open source compressor I developed very long ago, and everybody was using it until, well, the first contact was promising. Until a big company that makes a GIS software entered the picture and said, oh, yeah, we want to work with you. Oh, uh, but legally, that looks a bit tricky. Oh, we have technical difficulties integrating your stuff. I mean, everybody else integrated it, but not them, okay. Uh, so I made a very clean DLL. Look, it's very easy now. Um, and not only for that company, but also for Bob. Bob, Bob from Fusion. Bob from Fusion also wanted a clean DLL, so I had double reason. And I thought, okay, now the hurdles are gone, but 
No, that was just the beginning of the uh, dark chess um, fight because a customer of mine told me they were announced by Esri a new compressed format that everybody would want soon. And I said, yeah, no, they're talking about the stuff I'm developing. It's the same thing. Said, no, 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 it looks different. And then he forwarded me the email. That's why I put darkness. He forwarded me the email and it was the same guy, the same guy I've been talking with for two years, sent that email to him. So they have been planning that all along, leaving me in the belief that they were gonna cooperate with me. So that was really not nice. So I made the announcement for them of the new compressed format, which they didn't like so much. Um, but, and then a lot of open source people realized, oh my God, you know, the, the big guy is, is on the march again and they all started firing. So a lot of open source developers that are famed bloggers picked up the story, talked about it. And cartoonists also, uh, cartoonists started making cartoons about it. Uh, this one here and this one here. I don't know what happened to this cartoonist. I don't know where he's from because he stopped making cartoons about LIDAR. He made one about uh, forestry too. Uh, I thought you would like that one. Um, and uh, it was clear that Esri was not gonna back down. I, I tried to engage him in communications many, many times, but it just wouldn't work. So I said, well, let's all out war. Uh, my first attempt was I like funny wars, so I made an April Fool's Day joke pretending me and Esri had come to an agreement and I sent this to all news outlet and they all basically printed it because that was actually the news everybody wanted to hear. I couldn't believe it, that didn't look at the date, it was 1st of April and a lot of people fell for it, even Esri employees, because it, it made so much sense. Um, and then I coded some stuff, uh, you know, to make it a bit more uh, funny, uh, so I made a, a liberator, I called it the last liberator, it took that Esri close format and liberated it and uh, that was well received. And then the OSGO uh, got on board and we wrote uh, uh, um, uh, an open letter to the open geospatial community. It got signed by 200 or so scientists and ultimately it was a PR disaster for Esri. They, they don't talk about it anymore. So basically the Desri, the Desri star exploded, but we need to be on the watch. You know, we need to be on the watch. They may come back any moment.